today is going to be the launching pad. So I'm going to kind of lay the foundations for this series. And the series is based loosely off of this amazing book from our doctoral professor, Pastor Chris and I are getting our doctorate together. Uh, now our mentor, but also even now our friend, Dr. Leonard Sweet, and it's called Nudge. I think the, the book cover will be coming up on your screen. Now, I can already hear some of you asking the question, Dwayne, what exactly do you mean by nudge? What an odd name for a sermon series. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Lynn's book, and therefore this series, is about completely rethinking how we do evangelism. However, just as the tagline of the book suggests, it's much more than about evangelism. Nudge is about an awakening. In his tagline for the book, he says, it's awakening each other to the God that's already there. So nudge is about paying attention. Nudge is about learning to read the sign language of the Spirit. Do you know the Spirit speaks sign language? The Holy Spirit has His own sign language that He speaks, but, but just like any sign, if you don't know how to, you may miss the sign. You know, have you ever missed a sign? You missed the sign, you got off on the wrong exit. Somebody probably did that today. Somebody probably will do that today. But sometimes you don't notice the sign or if you misinterpret the sign then you can get in big trouble. So, so, so we're gonna learn the sign language of the Spirit. We're gonna, we're gonna find, because sometimes, listen, the Spirit is always speaking, but many times the sign language He uses is more than words. The Spirit's always communicating, but many times His messages are subtle, more like a nudge than a push or a shove. You know, he's a dove, and the dove don't shove. So don't shove the dove, because the dove don't shove. Anyway, so we got to learn to notice the nudge. In this series, we're going to learn how to notice the nudge. Why don't you just say, I'm going to notice the nudge. If you're sitting by somebody, you guys just look at, look at the person by you and say, learn to notice the nudge. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I'm so honored to be here, but we're all here for you. We're here for you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to put me on like a coat and wear me today. Jesus, speak not only to me, but through me. Give me entrance into the hearts of every person that will listen to the sound of my voice, whether live or later. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in everything we do and say today. And if you agree, say amen. amen. Now, depending on your church history, your, your history with church, not your understanding of church history, but your personal history with church, when I say the word evangelism, a lot of things can come to your mind. Like right now, when I say evangelism, what comes to your mind? Now, now for some people, fear Guilt, duty, obligation, events, crusades, or maybe nothing at all because you have no church history. That's okay. But, but just in the beginning of this series, I want to kind of let you in on my journey with evangelism. I grew up with a grandfather on my mom's side, my maternal grandfather was a church planter. He was a, a fiery, fundamental Baptist preacher. And he would tell me these amazing stories. If you've been in the bridge a long time, you may have heard some of these stories where he would go door to door and he would share the gospel with people. And I was always in awe of him, but I, I never felt condemned if I didn't or couldn't do it the way that he did it. And like I said, he was kind of a hellfire and brimstone preacher, but he never made me feel condemned about anything. Probably because I was his grandson. 
And grandparents may guilt everybody, but they ain't gonna guilt their grandkids. Anyway, that's a whole nother subject. And all the grandparents said, amen. Or all the parents whose parents guilted them but won't guilt their grandkids, their kids. Anyway, you get the idea. Then I get to high school and I'm going to a private Christian school. And, and so the church that was attached to that school became the church that I began to attend. And, and they did a, an, a, an evangelism sort of course, an evangelism summer. So all summer for two weeks, we would, or two, not two weeks, that wouldn't be very long, for two months, sort of like July and August or June and July, I don't remember exactly, but for, I think it was eight weeks, we met every Sunday night and we would pray together and we would go out in teams and we were gonna evangelize. We we're gonna go door to door and we were gonna share the gospel. The problem is, I don't know that a lot of good news is being shared. It was more a lot of turn or burn, I think, by a lot of people. Not me necessarily, but by some people. Anyway, when we would come back, so we, all the streets of the city were divided up. It was very organized. It was very systematic. We would go out, and we were knocking doors, and you would share your faith, and then you'd go to the next one. Then we would come back, and it was kind of like a sales meeting, and everybody would tell how many deals they closed, because you got to close the deal. Come on, every salesman knows you got to close the deal. And so there's this one guy who was actually a salesman. He was a top notch salesman. I won't say what industry he was in, but it's pretty stereotypical. <laughs> Narrows it down to two or three. Anyway, he would come back and he always had like a million people got saved. Every person that he knocked on their door and their, his team, they always got saved according to him. And so I started really feeling bad about myself. I, 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 I really started thinking, I can't do that. And, and listen, I'm a pretty good salesman. I made my living selling lots of things over the years. But I thought, man, I'm just not closing the deal good enough. Until I accidentally walked down, me and my team walked down a street that he had already done. I think he got confused because surely we didn't make the mistake. But anyway, that's a joke. So we knocked on the door and this person, this guy said, look, folks, your, your, your people have already been here. We said, what do you mean your, our people have already been here? So this dude, and they described him, they said he came and listen, he got in my house somehow and, and he would not leave. And so he said, I would have said anything, I'd have prayed any prayer, I would have agreed to anything just to get him out of my house. I thought, well, that was a fluke. So I go to the next door, knock on the door, same story. All of a sudden, I didn't feel so bad about myself because I realized that this guy was using a method of evangelism, quote, unquote, and I'm using air quotes there, to coerce people into accepting a proposition rather than, as Pastor Jay says all the time, an invitation into a transformation. So rather than, rather than uh, he, he was offering them a, a proposition or a transaction right. rather than inviting them into transformation. Then, I, then I, I, I got out of high school and I went to Bible college. That should be a better experience, right? I get to Bible, Bible college and we had a ev mandatory evangelism course. Everybody took it. Guess what we did? Went out two by two, street by street, all around our college campus. And, and, and again, as I met people, they would say, look, your students have already come and done this. Leave me alone. And, and I realized that this group had been over evangelized. Rather than taking the time to get to know people, rather than, than taking the time to, to, to really interact and build relationship with people, they were selling a product. Can I present an idea to you? Jesus is not a product. I could keep going, but you get the idea. All this and many more stories we don't have time for left me longing for more. I just knew there's gotta be a better way. 
I want us to see something. If you've had a similar experience, maybe you were the person that couldn't get the person out of your house. Or maybe you've been forced into different what types of evangelism. There's an underlying premise for all of these ideas and styles concerning transactional or propositional evangelism that is this. Here's the phrase. I've got to take Jesus to the world. Sounds good, doesn't it? Where did it come from? Where did we get this idea that I have got to take Jesus to the world? Well, a very thir- short 30 second history. There's a thing called what we now call colonial missions. In the days of colonial Britain, they were colonizing the world and the same ships that, sent, that they sent to colonize places carried missionaries to also convert places. So they equated colonization and colonializing a nation or a people with the idea of converting them to Christianity. So they were gonna take Jesus to the heathens. They they, they thought it was their God-given mandate to take Jesus to these people who don't know him. In other words, they, we, I, have got to take Jesus to all these places where he isn't already. Now I got a news flash for you. Taking Jesus to the world, or to anybody for that matter, is a fallacy. So you can just mark a line straight through that I've got to take Jesus to the world. Just just mark that out. If you wrote that down in your notes, mark it out. Why? Because watch this. How can I take Jesus somewhere he hasn't already been? How can I find a person or a place where Jesus already isn't doing something? Now, now you may say, Dwayne, this seems like just total semantics and it's very small. It may be to some people, but I'm telling you, it's a major paradigm shift for many people. About 30 or 35 years ago, I was given a book that forever changed my thinking along these lines. It's called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. The title is taken from a phrase in the middle of Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. That little phrase, he placed eternity in their hearts. It's the premise of this book. In the Amplified Version, it says it this way. He also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose, in the human heart a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. The premise of the book was basically the idea that God has placed eternity in the hearts of humanity. He's already placed redemptive keys inside of every culture, every family, every person. We just need to find the keys that God already placed there. So we gotta find the signs if we're gonna read God's sign language. So so listen, we aren't taking Jesus to people. We're simply noticing what he's already doing in them. And we're participating with the Spirit's activity in their lives. Listen, he left signs along the way as to what he's up to in their lives, but we gotta learn to read the sign language. And like we've already said, there can be signs everywhere, but if I can't read the signs or if I misinterpret the signs, I'm gonna end up in the wrong place. So here's a statement that I want all of us to get. Jesus is actively working by the Spirit in the life of every human. Every human, think about that, every human. But Dwayne, I can't see God working in that terrible neighbor that annoys me so bad. I can't see God working in that colleague, that work colleague that just really gets on my nerves. 
I can't see it in that crazy cousin or, or in that person from the other political party than me. Surely God's not working in those people. Watch this. I'm not finished with my statement. That's why it has three dots. I love three dots. Jesus is actively working by the Spirit in the life of every human, whether I notice it or not. Let that soak in for a minute. That person you can't stand, God's working in their life. You're just not noticing it. That person that's annoying you, God's working in their life. You just didn't notice it yet. So listen, Jesus is actively working by his spirit in the life of every human, whether I notice it or not. And guess what else? That includes me. See, when I was at my worst, Jesus was moving in my life. When he was nudging me. When I was failing, and I, he was nudging me. When I was blowing it, he was nudging me. I didn't notice it, but he was doing it. Jesus is always at work in every human. I want you to, if you don't get anything else today, get that. Now, now listen. Sometimes God sends a nudger to nudge me to notice his activity in my life. That's pretty cool, huh? But then sometimes he wants me to be a nudger that helps people notice the nudge of his activity in their life. So, so God's always nudging me and he always wants me to be a nudger. If I'm gonna notice the nudge of the spirit moving in someone else, I must first notice the nudge of the spirit moving in me. Leonard Sweet says it this way. I believe the lifeblood of evangelism is not propositions, we've talked about that, but prepositions. For God to do something through us, preposition, God must be doing something in us, different preposition. If we're not always evangelizing ourselves, we have no business evangelizing others. So, so in this series, we're gonna talk about the nudge of God to us as well as the nudge of God through us. We're, 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 we're gonna be talking about God, uh, God's nudge to you, but when we're talking about God's nudge to you, remember he wants to give a nudge through you. And when we're talking about God's nudge through you, remember he wants to give a nudge to you. So whichever one we're talking about, no, both are at play. Are you with me? Here, there's a great example to help us see this found in the story of Moses and the burning bush. It's, the, the whole story is longer, but but, but I can, you can get the, the, the gist of it in five verses. So I'm gonna take the time to read those. You can read along with me. They'll come up on the screen. Exodus three, verse one, I'm reading out of the NIV. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it was never consumed or it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange thought, a sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now watch this. God is nudging Moses to go nudge Pharaoh to let God's people go. God was literally going to use signs through Moses to speak to Pharaoh. His staff was going to turn into a stick. All those plagues, all that stuff are signs. That's God's sign language to get Pharaoh to turn God's people lose. But before Moses could be a nudger, God used some sign language to nudge him. And the sign language was a burning bush. Now, now Moses could have missed it, but there's five things that I think can help us find our burning bushes. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, 
we can learn, first thing we can learn from Moses' encounter, number one, pay attention. Notice the nudge. There, there was an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and did not burn up. Did you catch that? An angel appeared, but the angel didn't appear as an angel because Moses didn't see an angel. He saw a fire. Could it be that we missed the angel because we missed the fire? Are you getting that? See, it wasn't unusual for a bush to catch on fire in the desert. That happened all the time, but usually they caught on fire, 120 degrees in the desert, a bush will catch on fire, but it's consumed, it burns up quickly and it burns out. This one was burning and it wasn't burning up. What unusual things are happening every day around you in your life that you're missing? What bushes are burning and you're dismissing them because you think it's not unusual, but there's something different this time? That's number one, pay attention. Number two, go check it out. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush doesn't burn up? Now, now listen. If you go check it out and it's not God, no big deal. It hurts nothing to go check it out. But if you go check it out and it is God, everything just changed. Somebody say, check it out. Number three, hear God's voice within the sign. In other words, hear God calling you calling to you from within the sign. When the Lord saw that he had gone over, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. God could have called him from anywhere, but he called him from within the sign. When, when somebody's preaching, I listen for the voice within their voice. I listen for the voice of God within their voice. When I'm sensing a sign from God, I gotta learn how to listen to the voice of God within the sign. What is he saying to me? Listen, <laughs> there's always a voice within the sign. Number four, make yourself available. He said, here I am. Every invitation requires a response. Moses could have just stood there, but he responded. Do you know big things happen when you give God your yes. When you give God your yes, big things happen. And then number five, the fifth thing we can learn from this is slow down. Somebody say, slow down. Don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. God tells him to stop. Take off your shoes. Recognize this is a holy place. And I would like to add a holy moment. Are you slowing down and stopping long enough to let God show you holy moments? To let him show you those moments that he's moving in your life? I wanna ask you a question. How fast does God go? What is God's speed? What speed is he moving at? I wanna suggest to you that God, most of the time, moves at three miles an hour because that's about how long it takes for a human to walk. See, God wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. Sometimes he may ask us to run, I get that. And sometimes God is, there a, is a sense of urgency, but most days God's walking at the pace of humanity, but we're running at the pace of a frenzy. So let me ask you a question, are you walking with God? Are you walking slow enough to notice when he wants you to stop and recognize the holy moment? I want to finish up in the next just few minutes. I'm going to give you five different, a, a new list. Today's got a lot of lists. I'm going to give you five other things. And I'm going to do these quickly. And these are five truths about people that every nudger should know. You ready? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give these to you fast. We'll unpack these later. I'm gonna give them to you fast. Number one, 
every person you brush up against is a child of God. Every interaction I have, every, every subtle moment, every time I just somehow interact, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to step on your foot. That person is a child of God. Every interaction I have with any human, if I start with the premise that they're a child from God, it changes everything that happens after that moment. If I view you as an adversary, as I view, if I view you as an enemy, if I, if I view you as an agitation or an annoyance or an inconvenience, I'm not going to notice what God's doing in your life. But, if I, but if, I, if I recognize you as a child of the living God made in the image of God, guess what? It's going to change the way I interact with you. Number two. Every brush could be a burning bush. So every time I brush up against somebody, every encounter could be a burning bush situation. God is present in that person's life. Can I see the burning bush in their life? Maybe this happenstance encounter is God nudging me to nudge them, getting my attention so that He can get me to participate in getting their attention through the activities in their lives. Number three, this is a big one. Every best is because that person is blessed. See, the best parts of that person are a blessing from God, whether they know it or not. Every gift they possess is a gift from God. Every talent is because of God's grace. Every good thing about them is because of the goodness of God that He placed inside of them. But here's the counter to that one. Every blessed is because, every best is because they're blessed and every worst is a place for grace. See, the worst things about that person are arenas for God's redemption. God placed goodness in them, but every human messes that up. That's a place for God to pour His grace over their lives. He's working and weaving everything towards their redemption. See, a lot of times we get those two concepts mixed up. We get three and four confused. So what do you mean? See, we give people credit for the best things or the good things about them. And we blame God for the worst things. But it's actually the opposite. We should give God credit for the best things about people, the good things about them, and understand that, that they're responsible for the worst, but that worst is an opportunity for God's grace. So if I realize when I meet somebody, the best thing about them is a gift from God because He blessed them, but the worst thing about them is a place for God's grace to show up in their life, but I need to participate with His grace, not argue with them about their dysfunction. And then number five, and I'm done. Every person I notice in this life needs a nudge. People are hungry. They're hungry for encouragement. They're hungry for love. They just need help noticing the presence of the divine in their lives. Every person I notice in this life needs a nudge. If you'll write those five things down and you'll get them as truths into the very fiber of your being, part of every part of you, you will begin to become God's nudger. You can learn to notice the nudge.